Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. And I'm Peter Glassford. So, what have we been up to since we last talked? Well, we've been working away at our triathlon training, so I've been swimming and had a couple, I went to a group sort of clinic setting, and then I got a private instruction with the, the coach there, uh, who's local here to us. Uh, so that's going really well, and things are progressing. I'm up over 2,000 meters in an hour without, you know, drilling it too hard, so pretty confident I'll be able to, I'm hoping to get to up to 3,000 in an hour is sort of my goal in the pool, so. I can definitely attest that his swimming has gotten ridiculously better than where it was a couple of months ago. Yeah, so that's been fun being a beginner and getting instruction and just sort of, you know, I don't have to perform really at all in these sessions, so it's it's been cool. But also, you know, when you go with other people, it's also interesting just to see what it's like. You know, it, it is a little nerve-wracking, so it's helped me get sort of some insight into what people feel maybe when they come to the bike skill sessions and stuff I do too, is just, you know, it, while you can embrace being a beginner, there is sort of, you have to really be present and and open to that idea and sort of your feelings around, you know, getting beat or, you know, the person in the lane beside you sort of, you know, racing you a little and stuff too, and, and how you're going to respond to that. So it's been really interesting for me as a coach to sort of go through that. And then also just as an athlete to be a beginner rather than being someone who maybe has to perform or, you know, be at a certain level too. So, mm-hmm. so it's been fun. We've been doing that. We did a big walk with a friend the other day and just sort of caught up with him and toured around Toronto. So that was good and just sort of basic movement. But rather than sitting all day, we were out probably walking. I think we got like 15,000 steps. So I think it was maybe two hours of walking in the end. Yeah, Katie Bauman would be proud. If you didn't listen to her podcast a few weeks ago, definitely go back and listen to One of to our, that. I think maybe the most popular, but really it did well in her new books out too. So that's good. And yeah, I don't know, we're gearing up here. We're going overseas for, for Christmas uh, for some cyclocross stuff. And then, but this coming week's going to be really hectic. We got three talks at the Trek stores of the Greater Toronto area. Uh, so we'd love to see if you hear this. So we were doing Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesdays at Toronto, and we're also releasing uh, my, my mountain bike team sort of doing the team launch for that as well. And then that's also the launch party for Molly's new book, uh, Saddle Soar, the second edition. So I'm um, very excited for that, and it looks like we're going to get a good reception and stuff, so we'd love to see if you're in the Toronto area. Um, yeah, if you're not, you can go over to saddlesoarbook.com for, you know, the actual second edition, uh, Ride book. Comfortable, Ride Happy. It's... Got a bunch of new stuff talking about pregnancy, post-pregnancy, menopause, and even a chapter for the men in the audience, which is pretty exciting. So all about how to make your ride a lot more comfortable. Also exciting, it's on Amazon in print copy and the ebook. Yeah, so it's a lot easier easier to order for your Christmas presents. And on that note, I will say there are also gift guides over at saddlesarebook.com and a consummate athlete gift guide over at mollyherford.com. And we'll link to those in the show notes. Absolutely. All right. So today's podcast, though, before we start talking about ourselves a little bit too much here, is all about how to get into rowing. And for that, we have Sarah Hendershot, who is from Boston, where she runs an elite rowing program called Rowficient. Uh, Sarah has been a rower since high school. She raced for the Princeton rowing team. She was third at the NCAA. And rather than going into Wall Street after graduation, she elected to continue rowing at an elite level, which actually culminated with a fourth place at the 2012 Olympics in women's pair. So she was a super, super high level rower. She's sort of recently retired from, I'd say, elite competition, although she's kind of getting back into competing more for fun. So it's been really interesting talking to her about how she's kind of gone from the super pro lifestyle to kind of managing to be a athlete while also being a coach. She also works for Smack Media as a senior account manager. They're a PR company that I have come to know and love um, in recent years. Yeah, and it's been, I've always liked rowing as sort of a cross-training sport. It's it's really hard, but it's also, mm-hmm. it's got a lot of good benefits being full body and, you know, a little more horizontal in its positioning. So it can be really cool, uh, you know, with some cardiovascular adaptations as well. Um, yeah, it's a good way to hurt. So if you're dealing with, you know, winter and, and wanting to cross-train, it's a pretty accessible one. A lot of gyms have rowing stuff and, you know, different groups are putting together even classes now with the rowers. So... It's a really cool one. It's also a cool team sport if you can get out and do something like dragon boating or, or even rowing. Um, it can be really cool cross training sport as well. Or maybe it turns into your main sport. We don't know. But uh, and then the actual rowing 
philosophies, training and stuff is all really, really cool. I think they're, uh, they've are they been ahead of the game for a long time with things like the double days and uh, some of their training philosophies. So I think there's some stuff we can learn from training for rowing as well. So mm-hmm. we get into a bit of that as well today. Um, I think it's a, a pretty strong episode. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. Enjoy our episode of Sarah Hendershot. All right, welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. We're here today with Sarah Hendershot. Sarah's a rower. Uh, she's based in Boston, uh, and she's gone through. She's raced at the Olympic caliber. She's raced at the collegiate level, um, and now she's sort of at the end of her career, uh, if we can say that. And she's you know working away here at a couple different you know uh, fitness programs. She's got uh, one called Row Fishent, which we're excited to talk about and how we can use rowing to you know sort of get to our best fitness. Um, and then also just learn about sort of the world of rowing. Uh, and we're also excited just to talk a bit about that sort of retirement process, how we go, you know, leave the sport, so to speak, or, or come to terms with our sport after being at such a, an elite level. Uh, so really excited to talk to Sarah today. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, so we usually start with just sort of, uh, you know, sort of a description of how you get into your sport or, you know, into whatever role you're in. So for you, what, what I'd love to hear is sort of how you chose rowing. You know, for, for me, there isn't huge bodies of water necessarily super close by, at least, you know, I guess we have Georgian Bay. It's you pretty have the big. Georgian Bay in your backyard. Yeah, we have a great lake in our backyard. That's <laughs> not true. But I mean, rowing is not super um, presented, at least, you know, where I grew up. So how did you find rowing? Yeah, so rowing is definitely picking up steam. Um, and even since I started rowing, so I think, I guess that was like 14 years ago or so, it's really taken off, especially for women. Um, and that has a lot to do with Title IX. But uh, as far as how I got into the sport, um, I was always a very competitive little kid. I actually don't ever really remember playing sports and thinking they were just for fun. <laughs> I always. <laughs> remember like being on the soccer field and wanting to be the one that scored the most goals or won the game and it, and then none of this came from my parents it was it was like I would I would finish the game and be upset if we hadn't won um so I was always looking for things to try to push myself in um and when I got to high school uh, I actually didn't have a spring sport because the sports that I had been playing up until that point um didn't end up uh filling the three seasons of the high school schedule. So I was a soccer player and I was a swimmer and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for the spring. And I was debating, do I do track and field? Do I try lacrosse? And my parents are, they're so sweet. They kind of saw, um, I didn't have the best hand-eye coordination. And so probably lacrosse wasn't going to be the move for me, but they had heard that, you know, okay, you're, you're really tall and you have an aerobic base because you've been a swimmer for so long. We've heard that when you're tall, it really helps um, in rowing. And, you know, my high school, my public high school in Connecticut happened to have a rowing team, which was pretty unique at the time. There were not many programs um, in that's in the state that were with public teams. And so I just was lucky. And I walked down to the boathouse that first uh, day of spring practice, my freshman year, and pretty much fell in love with it right away. Um, and, and realized that it was going to be one of those sports that the more work that I put into it, the more that I would excel. And there were a lot of mental challenges as well as technical nuances that I really fell in love with right away. Hmm. That's, that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like your high school was really good. I don't remember having such structured like seasons and stuff where it sort of encouraged variety in in the sport, but then Canadian, you had hockey and curling. Well, I mean, we (laughs) we had some other stuff, like some schools had football and stuff, but I don't remember like you were a football player if you played football or you played soccer, but Mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of crossover encouragement. Like I feel like it killed most of the season. That's actually funny because there's, I read an article just yesterday that was talking about how important um, research has found being diverse athlete as you grow up and what that ends up doing for you in the long run and what researchers are calling super athletes, which I guess are athletes that have taken their sport to to the highest level. So, so many of them, I think it's something like 90% played three sports in high school. Um, And so I think what that did for me more than anything was just allowed me to develop as an athlete and allowed me to be healthy because I wasn't forcing my body to just do one movement over and over and over at such a young age. And and that way I was able to develop, um, you know, as as I was growing. So, yeah, I think I saw that one. It was like super performers versus like all like people who are still very peak performers, but not, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and I think that was like New York Times or something. We'll, we'll find that. that. I, I saved it yesterday, so let you go find <laughs> that. But, um, you mentioned Title IX and, and rowing being sort of specific or specifically good, I guess, for women, to put it briefly. But um, can you expand a bit on that? Like why, you know, at least at that time, why, why was Title IX and, and why was it rowing, you know, at least perceived to be better for women? Sure. So when Title IX came um, around in the late 70s, essentially uh, the, the rule and the idea behind it was that colleges had to spend the same amount of money on women's sports as they were spending on men's sports. Um, and so w- the way that this problem was solved in so many universities was they used women's rowing to offset men's football. Um, since men's football such a, carries such a large squad and is an expensive sport, they needed something that could do the same on the women's side. And rowing is a really great option because um, many, many teams have large teams and it is a little bit of an expensive sport. So uh, it ended up being that there were tons of scholarship opportunities for women to go to school to row. Um, and so that was my initial intent once I kind of found out about all of this. I, I knew I wanted to play a sport in college. Um, I, I thought it was going to be swimming for a long time. I actually kind of had my my heart set on going to the Olympics and swimming. Um, and I ended up with this pretty bad shoulder injury that limited the amount of training that I could do. So then I started to look, okay, could I go with for soccer? I wasn't quite good enough. I probably would have had to go to a Division three school. Um, but rowing was a great option. So I didn't end up going somewhere that offered an athletic scholarship, but it did lead to just so many other opportunities. And I know that I probably wouldn't have ended up where I am now if I hadn't chosen the school that I did. Hmm. That's interesting because I think a lot of kids, you know, as they're going into college and stuff would be very attracted to that, that scholarship, right? Yeah. Anywhere that made it seem like they wanted them for the sport. for sure. Yeah. Do you remember that decision? Like, why did you choose? Like, it was just because you didn't get offered a scholarship? No, I did. Um, I had a couple, I had a couple of uh, full scholarship offers. Um, and my poor dad, I have, uh, <laughs> I have four siblings, um, and so the fourth one is now just uh, a sophomore in college now, and she's the only one that accepted the the full ride uh, scholarship. Everybody else ended up choosing other schools, fell in love with different ones. So I was looking at Notre Dame, I was looking at University of Virginia, and then I was also looking at Princeton. And so when I went to Princeton, I pretty much got on campus and just absolutely fell in love with everyone um, on the team, uh, what the university stood for. And I felt like I couldn't turn down that opportunity to get uh, that high level of an education. But I also remember this very distinct feeling of once I got on campus, kind of thinking to myself, I, I sort of can see the person that I would become after four years of being here. And I want to be that person. Um, And Mm -hmm. so, so I, I kind of had to convince my dad (laughs) to let me go. I contributed to, you know, my, my tuition. I still am contributing through student loans. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, I mean, I think it was, I would think it was absolutely worth it because of the women that I, that I met, the coach that I was able to be coached by for four years, she dramatically influenced my athletic career. And then I met my husband at school. So lots of good things happened. I, I really wouldn't change anything, uh, you know, the way that it ended up going. Yeah. And you guys had pretty good success. Like you were, you, that was where you were winning national championships and stuff as well, right? Was with that Princeton rowing team. So, well, unfortunately, I missed out on a national championship. It's really funny. I was in school from 2007 to 2010, and the team won national championships in 2006 and 2011. So I was sandwiched on both ends um, and didn't actually get on myself. But I do really believe that I like, kind of helped to to build the team to the 2011. Um, uh, national championship that they won. Uh, it, there was some re- rebuilding that was required after the 2006 one. So I feel like I helped influence it to an extent, even though maybe I didn't get to take it away. But uh, we did have a lot of success. The Princeton rowing team is always one of the top teams in the nation. They always go to the NCAA championship. Um, and I was lucky enough to be named an All-American. So that was that was pretty special too. Yeah. And, and so you guys, I'm just looking back here. So you had undefeated seasons and you were third in the NCAAs. Right. So, yeah, it was my senior so, year. I mean, to really cinch that everything has to go right, as in any sport, right? Like, I mean, in basketball, you can get to a Final Four and you know not win, and that's just sort of the nature of the sport, right? It's you have to have everything aligned on that one day. Oh, absolutely. And with rowing in particular, there's definitely a level of luck involved because 
you are um, racing outside and so you're kind of at the mercy of the elements um, and wind plays a really large factor in the sport of rowing and it, it requires a lot of t technical advancement in order to be able to really um, master wind. Uh, but when you're on a rowing course, if you're if the, if the wind isn't hitting each lane exactly the same way, then sometimes one boat will have a slight advantage over another. Mm -hmm. So just by your lane draw, um, you know, sometimes that really affects what your result's going to be, and that's complete luck. So, yeah, I mean, things do have to come together, and I think that throughout my career, I've been on the good and the bad side of that, but when it when it lines up for you and everything kind of presents itself, you know that you've got to make it happen that day because you don't know how many other opportunities you're going to get like that. Right. And you don't hear that talked about very much at like the Olympics and yeah. whatnot where, you know, because even current, which I guess is maybe associated a bit with wind, like that has different places have different currents on different days and stuff. Isn't that part of it? Yeah, that's true. So um, at the international level, you there the standard is that it has to be on a body of water without a current because it uh, okay. can make things really unfair. Okay. Um, you're right. Wind isn't really talked about that much, I guess, uh, when you're watching rowing races or if you've watched the Olympics kind of thing. Um, but even watching the the racing in Rio, uh, it was pretty clear to the you know elite rowing scene watching it that there were lanes that were probably getting an advantage over others um just because of the way that the wind was hitting and so for the most part they they do their best to reseed the lanes to give the the highest seeds the better um opportunity but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot of sports have different things like that where you mm -hmm. get a slight yeah. advantage like an in, in starts position or, or something like that right right Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, you never hear about that. I just read some, it was some metric, and maybe it was on the wind speed at certain places, and they were saying that like rowing times uh, had decreased or something over this course of years. And then, you know, of course it went to doping. But then they were like, no, but if you look at these like coefficients, I guess it was of like wind or current or something, then it actually like just by chance, all the championships had been on days where that coefficient was, was less favorable. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, the evolution of equipment has done a lot to improve speeds in the sport of rowing because they used to row in wooden boats, these really heavy wooden boats, and now everything's carbon fiber. So yeah, the, that technology has made a huge difference. But if you are racing in a headwind, so the wind is pushing you back in the opposite direction of where you're trying to race, then yeah, obviously that's going to slow you down quite a bit. If you're in a tailwind, um, up to a point, it will help you. And then once it becomes too strong, uh, you if you can't keep up with the speed of the, the boat that the wind is um, you know, causing the boat to move at, then you actually, it doesn't help. It, it ends up hindering you. Um, so you have to be able to move so quickly and be so technically precise. And if you don't get your blade in the water by the time that the, that the boat has moved past that piece of water, then yeah, you're not being efficient. So that's getting a little detailed and nerdy, but, mm -hmm. um, the crosswind is the one that creates the disadvantage. So if it's coming at an angle, it will, it will hurt the boats that are furthest away from the crosswind versus the ones that are closest to it. Okay. Now, when you do have that tailwind, not to get back into the technical <laughs> stuff, really excited is, about wind. is it partially that the boat, like you start <laughs> nosing into the water because you're being pushed from behind and then you can't like pull the, the, the front of the boat out of the water? Well, no, it's more so that you're trying to get your blades into the water um, and, and have something to push against. So you're trying to find the resistance. So if you put your blades in the water too slowly and then don't uh, create the impulse quickly enough, you're not really pushing against anything. No. So okay. uh, it ends up just feeling like you're spinning and uh, the the drag is extremely light. So you need to kind of, you want that, that perfect in-between drag where it's not so, so, so heavy that it feels like you're weightlifting for 2,000 meters, but it's not so light that you can't grab it. So you want, you, it needs to be kind of somewhere in the middle there in order for you to have kind of the optimal race. Um, so after school then, so how you've been rowing now for, is that four years when you're done school or had you been rowing before university? So the four years for high school and the four years of university. So, so at that point, eight years. eight years in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. I like to just highlight that because sometimes nowadays with the cadets and the, or so we call them cadets, but the younger, you know, the junior athletes, um, you know, they think they've got to be that fast and doing this workout and this volume and, you know, qualifying for the Olympics like tomorrow. And it's like, okay, we haven't even talked about the four-year Olympic cycle yet. You know, and we're yeah, eight, we're eight years process. in. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you graduate and you had a chance to go to Wall Street. Is that true? Yes. Yes. And what were, you, what were you going to do in Wall Street? So uh, many of my classmates, um, I feel like, go on to went, went on to get really awesome, prestigious jobs or where they made a lot of money or or did things like went to Wall Street. And I think it's a pretty common path out of Princeton University. So I, uh, you know, went to all the information sessions. I went to the job interviews just to kind of see, you know, what my options were. And I had an internship after my junior year where I worked at Deutsche Bank um, just just as an intern. So pretty much the grunt work. Um and was working pretty insane hours, like 80 to 100 hour weeks yeah. for the three um, three month internship. Yeah, not sleeping a lot. Definitely came back out of shape that next fall uh, because you just have time for almost nothing else. And, um, you know, realized that that could probably put my career somewhere really solid if that was the path I felt like I wanted to take. But I, what, I wasn't very fulfilled by it and um, wasn't really sure if it was for me. So when I graduated, I had an offer to come back as a full-time employee, um, as an analyst um, on their investment banking side of things. Uh, and, I, and I asked them if they would be willing to defer that job for me while I tried to make the national team. And they actually were willing to do that. It was, they were really gracious about it. They ended up deferring it two years for me. And then uh, at the end of all of that, I still wasn't ready to go back to do that kind of thing. I, I was too in love with the sport and uh, decided to continue to row. So uh, I think it all worked out for the best. Um, I kind of think about what my life would have been like if I had decided not to continue to train at the elite level um, and just had you know gone gone to work. And I mean, I'd probably be a little bit of a different financial place at this point, but um, <laughs> We're really, we're, I mean, it's led us to a lot of amazing opportunities and I've met all different kinds of people and I have sort of figured out what I want to do with my life and, and it's a very different path at this point. Yeah. I love that. Okay. That's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people in that boat and you sort of have to, in that boat, so to speak. Huh. Um, yeah. But you got to be, you know, confident in your direction and, and go with it. And like you said, you know, you left sort of, you didn't even, you didn't burn all the boats, so to speak. But, um Left the door cracked a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You, but you're, it's you're, scary, right. you know. Yeah, it, it's like it's a risk, and and especially when you don't really know what the the path of sports going to look like. Uh, you know, I I had no idea if I was going to make the team. There's a very good chance I could put my life on hold and come up unsuccessful. Um, and and especially when your peers are all following a very different path, and they're following ones that seem like pretty structured and. And they they make sense, uh, you know, quote unquote. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it was scary. It was a big risk. But I'm lucky that I have friends and family that were all extremely supportive and wanted me to go after my dreams and wanted to see me happy. So, yeah, then I ended up just kind of relying on the people that I cared for the most and, and didn't listen to the haters. <laughs> I love that. So you gave, So then was it four years, like, pretty much, and you were at the Olympics? After finishing so it was school. actually only two. It was only two years because I graduated from college in 2010 and the London Olympics were 2012. So uh, I jumped into the cycle halfway through. Um, and sometimes that just happens based on your graduation timing. Um, mm -hmm. But uniquely, the women's national team trains out of Princeton, New Jersey. So I, I didn't actually move anywhere after graduating from college. And, and I think that definitely contributed to my decision as well because – the women that were on the 2008 Olympic team were in our locker room every day. So you're surrounded by them. You see who they are. You see what they're going through, how hard they're working, what their training schedule is like. But then it also kind of makes them a little bit more human. So it's not as if, you know, they're just that figure that you watched on TV that was standing on the medal stand. No, they're the, they're the girl that's sitting next to you that's changing, that's like sitting there exhausted after practice. So I kind of watched them and, and, saw how great they were, but then also thought that, I, you know, maybe I could give it a shot and I could, I could fight against them. Um, and, and so I transitioned from my college training directly into the national team training and just, um, joined them for the two years leading up to the London games. Oh, that's wow. awesome. I can, I can safely say that the, the women in Princeton do row crazy hard because I used to live in New Brunswick and work in Princeton. So I would be driving down alongside the really? river where you guys were training like every day, actually like around 2008, 2009. So <laughs> wow. funny. I, I probably drove past you or actually rode my bike past you guys since the, the bike path is also there. 
Uh, yeah. Yep. That's that's really funny. That's a that's a good coincidence. Mm-hmm. So did anything in those? So once you graduated, then and you were you know part of the the big team, and you were leading towards the Olympics. Like, how did that sort of volume and intensity and stuff like did did much change, or did you feel like it was just sort of now you didn't have school in the mix and you just sort of went to to row every day still? No, it dramatically changed, um, and that's because. As a student at Princeton, um, they're very strict about the philosophy of you are a student athlete. So you are a student first, you are an athlete second. And the academics are very rigorous. So there's only so much time that you can spend practicing your sport. And actually, the Ivy League institutes rules to make sure that that is enforced. So there are a certain number of days per year that you're not allowed to practice. And, and the intention behind that is that you're going to spend that time studying instead. And trust me, they're pretty much right. Every moment that we weren't at the boathouse, we were studying uh, or occasionally socializing. <laughs> but um, but so, yeah, it's, once I graduated, we went from really kind of a low volume, high intensity program to a very high volume, low intensity program. Um, the U.S. still, for the most part, follows a long, slow distance approach, which, uh, you know, I, I was able to be successful at at age 22 and 23. And, and then I went to the Olympics at 24. But pretty much um, after that, uh, the volume was a little too much for me. So that changed my last Olympic cycle approach uh, just because I think it, you know, it wears you down and um, everybody's bodies seem to handle it differently. But a lot of that happens has to do with your mechanics. And I ended up finding out that I was lacking in the mechanical department and then I wasn't able to handle that high volume. So so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of kind of the way that the training shifted, but it felt very different because the high volume approach just essentially turned me into a zombie. <laughs> yeah, it does that. You can get fit, yeah. but yeah, it's not all much, a lot of left after doing it. Yeah. Peter's the worst. Yeah. He has those weeks. Um, yeah. Yeah. I came through the same sort of thing with cycling and then sort of as I've gotten older, I think, and it's hard to say, I think life gets busier in the high intensity, you know, the, or more balanced approach makes more sense. And it's, Hard to say if I went back whether I'd be able to handle it, but I think sometimes it's age too. Sort of, I think that's how you even started. Was that you were 22 when you were doing the high volume, and you, you know, you got the adaptation out of it. But there's a certain point where, you know, there's just no more adaptation that can come out of it, right? Exactly. And so there's a need for the aerobic base in the sport of rowing, but I think what is maybe a little bit forgotten or or we haven't quite caught on to um, in in the U.S. at this point is. At the end of the day, the race is seven minutes long um, or a little bit faster or a little slower. Um, and so I kind of as I've gotten older and I've educated myself more just on physiology and the sport in, in general, I've realized that the way that we're training is we're training as if we're going to go race a marathon or or at least a 10K or a 6K when really our, our sport requires us to be good at a 2K. So I think that there should be more of a balance between the intensity and the power that you bring to the sport um, and to the training plan. And, and on top of that, every athlete is different. So just because, you know, a, a high volume program works for some doesn't mean that it's going to work for all. And in fact, every athlete has different weaknesses and strengths. So sort of, it's my belief that you should be you choosing your training plan based on who you are as an individual athlete and not necessarily just as what's been successful for some people in the past. Right. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there a, a way like how, how, how have you found that you can sort of figure out, you know, even just roughly which direction someone might want to go with their training? Is there anything from your experience you've seen like where either with yourself or teammates or people you've worked with? As far well, as we've choosing. done a lot of physiological testing, so um, that's been part of it. You know, testing lactate, testing your VO2 max, um, kind of trying to see where your inflection points are as far as uh, those different measurements and and where where your weaknesses are. Um, but another thing I think is good is just self experimentation. Um, so that's the easiest way I think to kind of figure out what works and doesn't work is use yourself as an experiment. Uh, when I was rowing high volume, I hurt all the time. I was broken. I got injured a lot. Um, and I, I did not feel like myself. I felt like a shell of myself. And when we changed uh, my program to something that was 
not not completely no volume like there was still a place for volume but it was lower and the intensity was higher and power and form and skill became the the biggest focus point for me i felt completely different all of my scores got better um i could show up to practice and feel much more engaged and energetic and ready and excited to train rather than dreading sessions just because i couldn't even peel myself out of bed so, so and I, not all of my teammates reacted that way to high volume some of them um saw in, like incredible fitness improvements and could bounce back from a really high volume training session and so for those athletes you know it clearly was working better so yeah i mean i think there's there's a few different routes you can go but just being being unafraid enough to actually play with yourself as an athlete i think is a is a great option yeah and i think that feeling off the bike you know most of the season sorry off the <laughs> you know yeah, when you're just... <laughs> outside of training um it is important right like a you know especially for most athletes you know are, are regular people you know if you're drilled all the time like year round you're just drilled and like you say a shell of yourself then you know, you're not adapting very well, right? And so, you know, what if you could pull out, you know, an hour of training there or train a little easier and then a little harder a couple days a week and, you know, feel awesome off the bike and sleep a little better and, you know, be socially a little happier, you know, it just seems like a no brainer, but it's very hard, yeah. very hard to make yourself do that once you've sort of developed that addiction, I guess, right? Yeah. And, but I mean, it's interesting. I got my blood work done when I came home from London and my hormones were so out of whack from two years of training really high volume. So yeah, I mean, it's clear, like that's why I was feeling terrible is because it was messing up like everything from the inside out. Uh, and so, I mean, I just found that, so I, we can talk about this a little bit more if you want as well. After the London Olympics, I did attempt to make the Rio team. And I, you know, so I basically just, um, have stopped training about four months ago. Um, the last cycle, I was so much more happy and so much more engaged and it loved the process, but that's why I think I was seeing more success as far as my fitness and my skill went. Um, I, I really enjoyed all the steps along the way. Uh, and I, and I do think that that's a huge point. You can't forget if you don't love what you're doing every day, you're just not going to be the best version of yourself. Hey everybody, we're going to interrupt the podcast for just a second for a quick word from a new sponsor. Are you a consummate athlete? I think so. I think so too. Why don't you head over to healthiq.com slash consummate athlete, help out the podcast, and also check out your health IQ. In addition to being a health insurance company, a life insurance company, mm -hmm. Health IQ has a really great website. They have really cool articles that they're posting all the time on their own blog and also just sort of their feed. Um, you know, I clicked on actually three or four while I was there, just interesting articles that popped up. So it might be a real great website to visit just on the regular anyhow, even if you don't want life insurance. Uh, that said, life insurance has been something that you and I have actually been talking about a ton recently. And the cool thing about Health IQ is they actually have special rates on life insurance for consummate athletes. Yeah, they basically advocate for lower rates for healthy people. You know, your weightlifters, your your runners, your cyclists. Um, high five. Yeah, I guess high five if you're one of those people. And so basically they're trying to leverage the fact that there's lower risk for cancer, say 45% lower, even 18% lower heart disease risk and 28% lower risk of early death for active people. So Double again, high five. that's great. So why would you pay for those higher rates, you know, that are taking those averages, you know, all those people who are you know, doing those unhealthy things. They're not out running, putting in the miles, you know, being healthy. Um, so yeah, basically their idea is, that, you know, getting lower rates for life insurance, you know, which might fit into your sort of overall financial plan, uh, or it may not. But in any case, why don't you head over to healthiq.com slash consummate athlete. Again, help out the podcast, check out some cool articles, maybe take a few of their quizzes. I, I actually got two wrong on their weightlifting quiz. Womp womp. So, uh, yeah, still a pretty good score, though. I think I beat 63 million Americans. So why don't you go to healthiq.com, see how many Americans you can beat. Um, it's weird. I apologize to the Americans. You could beat an American if you were an American. That happens. <laughs> so, I yeah. forgot you were Canadian. Healthiq.com slash consummate athlete. Thanks, guys. And now back to the podcast. So in the last four years, then you've done 
you know, a more mixed approach or higher intensity. Um, but you didn't make it, but that doesn't mean that it didn't work. Like your, your, your numbers and right. stuff were all still improving. Um, and this is, you know, yeah. again, for the sake of, you know, we're 10 to 15 years in the sport now for this last four yes. year cycle. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, was, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say there's a lot for context, like you didn't make the Olympics, but I imagine the sports also gotten really like it's progressed. There's, you know, 10 more younger people coming up and, you know, trainings improving and everything for everyone. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so, so I, you know, so I made the London team in 2012 and then I continued to try to train that same way until 2014, the high volume approach. Um, but was so like injured, healthy, injured, healthy, injured, healthy for those two years. And I actually was, I actually competed in London in pain. I, I had just been recovering from a rib fracture, which is, the most common injury in rowing, if you can believe it. And it's not from impact. It's like a stress fracture. So it's essentially like a shin splint, um, but, but on your ribs because the muscles get so tight in that area. So, uh, not a fun one because everything hurts. You can't roll over, sleep, laugh, sneeze, anything like that, uh, without being in pain. So, um, there was one point where then I ended up having a hip impingement and I couldn't even sit for 10 minutes comfortably. So clearly it was, I was at a crossroads in my career. It was like either something dramatic needs to change or I need to retire because I can't keep going on in this broken state. Um, and really my only option was if I wanted to train a different way, I couldn't train in with the centralized group in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, they kind of do still fall away one program fits all athletes sort of philosophy. And I was very clearly a round peg in a square hole or whatever that phrase is opposite. <laughs> um, and so I needed to go off on, on my own and kind of figure out how to get healthy and how to be successful and fit uh, on my own. Um, and that ended up leading me down this path where I worked with different rolling coaches, physiologists, strength trainers, sports psychologists. Um, and I switched partners a few times along the way as well. Um, but through that process, I became, I think the best athlete I've ever been. Um, my scores 100% were better. I think I was also rowing the best I'd ever rowed. I got, I had some of the best rowing result uh, results that I'd ever had. Um, at the end of the day, unfortunately, what, what happened was I, um, my, o my only option for making the team became to to try to make one of the big boats. So we call big boat, uh, the eight women boat or the four women boat. Um, and, and that is selected through the centralized Princeton center. So obviously like not super look, looked fondly upon for, for me to have left and then tried to come back and, and make a boat. Uh, and then when the coach is making the decision about who's going to go into that lineup, you know, there was a, there was a little bit of tension there. So mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of factors that went into uh, the, the end lineup that went to Rio and, and me not being part of that squad, but it's true. I don't look at my last cycle as a failure. I look at it as a success because I improved and I really feel like I was very close to my peak potential. Um, and so you got to be able to, you have to walk away with some sense of satisfaction from, from that kind of result. I think so. And the Olympics are very tough like that. I mean, I think even world championships for a lot of sports is, is even somewhat like that. And you, to be in the sport as long as you were and successful as you were, I think you have to be able to have that ability to go away and, you know, every day see, you know, yourself and yourself getting better and, you know, take pride in those other wins and other components of the sport and not be so focused on the Olympics. Right. And Right. Cause then really what else are you, what are you doing it for? I mean, the four years that lead to the Olympics are, that's the day in and the day out. You have to find, find the, the great moments in that. And that's really what, what sticks with me now too. It's I'm, I'm, you remember the, the mornings, the, the routine, all of those little ups and downs and struggles. That's what I loved the most. Yeah. So you went, so you, the, your whole career, you were in pairs, like in a two person boat, and then just towards the end, you, you tried to go for the eight person. Well, you train in all different kinds of boats um, okay. because they all require a different sort of skill. Right. So I learned to row in an eight in high school. I raced eights in college. Um, and then I won a world championship in um, a four twice uh, in 2010 and 2011. Um, and then it was after that that I really started to become – focused on the two woman boat, the pair. Uh, but throughout the whole training process, you're training in every single kind of boat. You're training in a single, a pair, 
um, a four, an eight, because they, they act as different kinds of training tools and they help to keep things fresh. And you also really learn a lot of different lessons from rowing with different women because I mean, not only is it awesome to like mix personalities and strengths and weaknesses, but you can learn a lot about the technical side of things by rowing with, with, um, rowers that are more proficient than yourself. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, there were, there was a point where I was being looked at for the eight and then, um, and, but I, I, my love became the most for the women's pair. Um, I think because it's just you and one other athlete. So it, you, it's a very honest boat. You can't hide in a pair, uh, like you can sometimes get away with having one weak link in an eight. You really cannot do that in a pair. Uh, it's either you or your partner and you can only blame your partner so much before you realize it's you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's really kind of why I loved that boat. Um, and, and, and I ended up trying to go for that it, for Rio just and mostly because I'd seen success with it in London, but then also because if you're trying to leave the the pool of the, the camp where all the other athletes are, it's far simpler to, to bring one person with you than it is to bring seven. <laughs> sure. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit here. The What do you feel like, you know, you've started here a, a bit of a program called Rowficient. Where, like, how do you see rowing, you know, and, and when you're talking with this, this is like indoor rowing on like an erg, right? Uh, it's both. So okay. it's indoor rowing and it's, yeah, and it's for on the water for athletes that actually want to pursue the sport. Wow. So very specific. Okay. So I'm interested about that as sort of like an entry point maybe for rowing. I wonder if that's, why don't you just tell us about row efficient then to start mm -hmm. and, and do you see it as like an entry point for, to try and get people rowing who aren't rowers? Well, how we see it. So, um, essentially we've taken the philosophy that we have developed over the last four years leading up to Rio and we're trying to spread it through the rowing community. So both, you know, rowers that row on the water and people that want to just get into the sport or want to, to, you know, include a different aspect into their fitness on the rowing machine. And the concept is we're calling it row efficient because, um, we're playing on row efficiently, right? So that's part of, what I learned over the last four years is that if you're not moving efficiently, if you're not like as a human more than even just as a rower specifically, if you're not moving efficiently, you're not going to reach your potential. Um, you're going to end up becoming a super compensator. You'll make something else strong that really has no business uh, being strong. So we're, we're trying to help the rowing community. Yes. We're trying to help them to, to realize that there is more than one way to achieve elite fitness. It doesn't always have to only be with the long, slow distance approach, but then we also want to help, let's call it more of like the regular population learn, um, that you can take aspects of the way that elite performers train and you can in incorporate it into your own life. Um, and those concepts become quality and uh, really focusing on yourself as a, as a human and, and, and a mover before a specialized athlete. Um, and, then, and then taking the skills that we've learned about the technique and helping somebody to just like pick up the sport and pick up good movement patterns. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Um, so then what would be like, are you, do you have people off, like off the rower, off the, off the water? Like, are they doing calisthenics and stuff? Like, is there, you, you talk about being a better mover. So to me, that sounds like you're, you're getting people up doing, you know, basic human movements off the right. boat. Yeah. So, um, right now the people that we're working with there, it, there's a very large variety. Um, so people, um, actually like, you know, my, my parents aged masters athletes that just want to stay fit and we help, help them to, to g gain more fitness and to be healthier, um, somewhat through using the rowing machine, but then also through, uh, weight training. Um, and, and so learning how to move well under load. Um, and obviously that's different for every individual. Some people it's going to be heavy and some people it's very light and just learning to do an air squat is a challenge. Um, then we're also working with CrossFitters. So rowing has become more and more, uh, a part of the CrossFit sport and CrossFit world. It's a part of all the competitions that they do. And so we have some great connections in that world as well. And we're helping both elite CrossFitters and recreational CrossFitters learn how to master the rowing machine. Um, and then as far as the sport of rowing goes as well, we're working with juniors, um, collegiate athletes, high school athletes, 
elite athletes and masters athletes um, and teaching them how to be better at the sport. So just kind of, you know, taking rowing and hitting it from every different angle because it is such a fantastic form of exercise. It is a full body, full body uh, movement. It engages all different kinds of muscle groups and it takes a lot of coordination. So it transfers to different movements as well. So we're using rowing and we're using weightlifting um, combined to really kind of make you a well-rounded athlete. What would you say was your biggest form of like cross training or maybe like if, it, if it's strength training with like a, a certain move in strength training that you did um, or that you feel is important for someone who's spending most of their time on a rower? Uh, well, lots of different stuff in the weight room, but I would say probably the exercise that translates the best is the deadlift um, because there are so many visual and, um, and just like kinesthetic applications between the two. Um, you, you essentially are picking something up heavy and trying to throw it over and over and over when you're rowing. Um, I love you're trying that, to, cause that's how I even try and mm -hmm. like, I'm very elementary in my concept to knowledge and rowing, but you know, we use it in the gym a bit more for warm ups and, and stuff here and there, but that's definitely the analogy I've sort of drawn as, you know, it, it should be similar to this movement. You know, you don't want to be, people always want to like make the chain is always slapping, which irritates me. So we'll get to that in a second, but um, yeah, you know, it, sh it, it should be a straight line. Like, yes. And a, and a slapping chain is a sign of disconnection. So the, the reason why it's so, so similar to the deadlift is your angles are very much the same when you're um, at full compression for the rowing stroke. And when you're about to pick up the heavy weight off of the floor, um, and then your, your order of operations and your order of engaging your muscles are very similar as well. So when we're teaching the rowing stroke, we often teach the deadlift first, um, because people then have something to understand the movement from, like they have a place to connect it from. And, and if you've been on the rower and you see the fan wheel on the side and how you can get it all the way up to 10 or all the way down to one, that's like the same concept of taking weight on or off of your bar for a, for a deadlift. Um, and so then finding, okay, what's that, what's that, um, perfect, uh, level for you on the rowing machine. So you, we usually suggest somewhere between the three and a five, if it's a new machine and, uh, and then translating that concept to, to the deadlift. But that's me. That was a really big helper for me as an athlete. And we've seen it like really turn on some light bulbs for other athletes as well. Hmm. I like that. So when you have someone on the rower and they're, um, you know, maybe not what I would call setting the bar, like they're sort of like, you know, jerking right at as they're pulling, you know, the the chain to start to instigate their pull. Um, how how do you cue that to sort of help someone, you know, pull smoother? I guess. Well, you want to be trying to move the load with your with your big muscles, right? Like that's where you're going to be able to create the most power. So. You should be thinking about moving the handle with your hips. So at, for every inch that your hips move, every inch that the, the seat moves back on that moving slide, the handle should come with it. And we see a lot of times people either grab with their arms, which obviously your arms are such a smaller mover than your hips, your glutes, your whole entire posterior chain. You're not going to be able to create as much power. So people will grab with their arms or they'll open with their back. That's why we see back injuries. Um, or another big fault is they actually, you'll, will slip with your butt. So your butt will shoot out so much faster and the handle won't move at all. Um, and so I think really the best kind of visual is for every inch my hip moves, my, my handle needs to move as well. And that makes it a much more, uh, streamlined process and initially gets people to use their bigger muscles first. I like it. Now, would you slow someone down? Like, is that worth doing like just really sort of going through the process maybe even on a lighter load or I don't know maybe a heavier load would be good but you know slowing someone down so that they're not you know immediately trying to go so fast that they're missing that sort of point of catching and that initial pull absolutely and so um, if you've ever been on a concept two rowing machine and you see that little number in the upper right hand corner mm -hmm. that's your stroke rate uh, it's telling you how many strokes you are taking per minute when we are initially teaching somebody to row, we do almost all of the the first you know technical steps between an 18 and a 24 strokes per minute. That's pretty that's pretty on the low end. That's so that you can be moving the mechanics correctly before you're just trying to create speed and power. And elite rowers 
do most of their training. I would say probably like 70% of their training within that kind of a zone. So even when I'm talking about me doing more intensity, there still is a lot of work being done at a slow, lower intensity because you're trying to constantly ingrain the good movement patterns. Um, and so, yeah, we would start that way. And just to give some perspective, if you're going to be learning somewhere between 18 and 24 strokes per minute, when you're racing at the Olympics or 2000 meters, most people are around 36 to 38 strokes per minute. So that's much faster turnover rate. Um, and that's something you have to build up to in order to be able to do it successfully. Yeah. And I think that's to your point that, you know, we can do volume and you'll get fit, but then you're going to go to a race and you're going to basically, you know, be overwhelmed by the fact that your stroke rate's really high or, you know, the intensity is really high. And you might even have the fitness to go pretty hard still because of that volume. Like certainly there's, it doesn't always have to be super specific to develop, you know, pretty good fitness, but it's even the mental and the coordination, the mechanics that you talk about, you know, there's about one way to do that. And it's by doing that, you know, race specific sort of effort, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so I, we like to say there's no point in becoming a professional steady stater. And that's what we call the low, the lowest long distance is the, is the steady state. Right. Um, if you practice that all the time and that's all, all that you practice, then yeah, you're going to become a professional steady stater and that's not going to win anybody a gold medal over a 2000 meter race. No, like you could like go across a channel or something probably with that. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's, what, that's what you're preparing for, right? Is like, you know, some sort of huge water crossing or, you know, um, I'm trying to think here where we want to go now. I'm wondering what, you know, would be, you talked about your training, you know, in the first Olympic cycle and the second Olympic cycle, what was the, you know, benchmark? Is it the, you know, sort of 500 meter or do you guys go longer? Like what's, what's the big, like in cycling, we have like CP 20 or like the FTP test. That's like pretty much everyone knows it. Like what is the thing in, in rowing? So the 2000 meter race would probably be the one, um, that's what's tested most universally. And, um, when, when you meet a new rower, it's like, Oh, what's your 2k score? Um, but that being said, there's a lot of different tests that are, that are run. Um, there's a, you know, we do a one minute test to kind of show, show where your power is. Um, that's a close equivalent to the 500 meter, but that's tested less, um, than the, the 2000 meters. Uh, but to make sure that your aerobic side of things are improving as well, um, five K's and six K's are tested a lot. Um, and so, yeah, you can kind of test a, a big spectrum of things to try to make sure that you're improving both your power and your aerobic capacity. But two K is really the one and, and that will take, um, an elite man. I think the world record is right around five minutes and 40 seconds. Um, and for women, uh, it's just under six, six minutes and 30 seconds. So yeah, it's a, it doesn't sound like that long, but when you feel like you're almost at an all out sprint for seven minutes, it's pretty painful. <laughs> yeah. I would say like we use, uh, like a five minute or six minute for VO2 sort of estimation in the field. And yeah, it's probably one of my least favorite. Mm -hmm. It's like three is okay. You can crack those out pretty easy three minutes, but yeah, 5k gets real for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> or sorry, five minutes gets real yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, we didn't really talk too much about retirement stuff, but I think we've gotten a lot of, of good, you know, thoughts there. Do you have any, you know, for athletes who are you know, even just coming up, you know, we talked about picking your school and, you know, it's a long-term process, but do you have any advice, you know, things that maybe you did, you're happy you did, or, or things that maybe you wish you did as you're going through university and those, you know, first Olympic cycles to prepare for life after Olympics, you know, once we're not counting down, you know, your years necessarily in the sport, you know, where, you know, now you're an adult and you're, you're carrying on, you know, what do you feel like is important to make that, that transfer, that transition you know, a little, a little more successful? Um, well, I think, I think I was lucky that I did do a lot of things well. Um, like one of the things I guess I could uh, talk about now is um, just kind of trying to line yourself up for a career after sport. Um, and so right. you the, went to, the, you went to school. So that was a good first step, I guess. That, yeah. That's one prioritizing your education. Um, and, you know, knowing that, there's, you want to have that to, to lean back on after. Um, but then also, so in the U S even at the elite and the Olympic level, there's not a ton of funding for the athletes. And so the, 
U.S. Olympic Committee does give some money, it's a very small amount, to the very top athletes in the sport. Um, and so if you are training and you're not on the very top of that list, you're not getting any money to, to train. You have to figure out another way to support yourself. Um, and so that's pretty much what I did through the entire time that I was on the elite side of things. I got a little bit of money once I made the Olympic team, but that was about it. Um, and so you, you have to have another job and, uh, you have to have something that's going to be flexible with your training schedule. Um, but then from my perspective, I was trying to find something that I could also develop into a career when I was done. And so I was lucky enough that I've been working for a company called smack media for the last four years and we're a sports marketing and PR firm. And we're really unique in the fact that all, we're an all female team and everybody that's a part of Smack Media is also an elite athlete, which is pretty crazy. So, you know, we have a, um, a woman on the team who went to the Canadian Marathon Olympic trials this past year. We have a couple other professional runners. We had a professional triathlete for a while. We have an ex LPGA golfer on our squad, an Ironman, you know, just like ever, there's a big spectrum of the, of the athletes, but. It, it brings this really cool perspective to the work that we do. And, my, you know, my boss was awesome enough to kind of let me work just the hours that would make sense while I was training. And now I'm full time for them uh, because I'm not training full time anymore. So that's been a really great segue. You can take the experiences that you've already had as um, an athlete and now I'm applying it to, to work. So I think like part of that was just me planning well, um, and trying to figure out something that, that, um, you know, would be a good transition for me. Uh, as far as things, maybe I wish I did better. I sort of wish that I had like allowed myself to enjoy the day to day of my first cycle a little bit more. Uh, there was just so much stress uh, every day because of the constant competition and that your butt was on the line and, you didn't know what was going to happen and there's so many ups and downs and maybe just trying to be a little bit more even keel about it and just enjoying the, the amazingness of being able to do that, um, for your, you know, your day to day life. Um, and I was better at it my second cycle, but I sort of wish that while I was young and I was in the throes of things that maybe I'd appreciated it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Like not, you know, take care of yourself in the long term, but you know, making sure that those workouts, you know, it's not just going out and being miserable for however long you're out there, but mm -hmm. you know, right. finding some friends, like I think rowing, at least there's some community there, but I think, you know, a lot of other sports are pretty easy to become pretty isolated and, and miss that, you know, the benefit of training with others, but also the enjoyment and the camaraderie and, and all that too. So I think that's great advice. Yeah, that's huge. Awesome. Well, I think that's a lot of good stuff. I could pick your brain on rowing and rowing training for a long time, but I don't know if anyone would find it interesting except for me. So, I would. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll maybe we have to get you back on to go more deep on some rowing physiology and, and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. So many good things. I think a lot of things for younger athletes and their parents and anyone who wants to try some rowing in the gym or on the water. So, uh, oh, great. Yeah. Well, also next time we're in New Jersey, you're still in New Jersey as well, yeah, right? She's in Boston. In Boston. Okay. Well, yeah. we're, we're up that way a fair bit too. So we'll have to try and connect and maybe try out some of this row fishing. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime. Rowing is huge in Boston. It's a oh, really, yeah. really big community. So uh, yeah, it makes it easy to stay involved and um, just a lot of people interested in the sport here as well. So absolutely. Okay. So where can people find you on the interwebs? Um, well, they can find me, all of my social media handles are at Sarah Hendershot. Um, and then they can find Roficient just at Roficient. Um, pretty simple. Um, yeah, Roficient.com will bring you to our page. Uh, but yeah, most of, most of the fun content, um, just of following our day to day is through my, my personal page. And then most of the technical and the, the really sports specific stuff's on Roficient. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll let you know when everything goes up. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. This was fun. All right. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Sarah. Okay, bye -bye. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. We would love it if you'd go over to iTunes and leave us a review. And if you have any ideas or people you'd love to see on the podcast, feel free to tweet at us at Peter Glassford and at Molly J. Herford or find us over at consummateathlete.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.
Just a reminder to head over to healthiq.com slash consummate athlete to get your life insurance quote and find out how active people can get a good rate on their life insurance.